Welcome to Straight Talk for Entrepreneurs, where we reveal what it really takes to build a successful business. Whether you are starting with an idea or growing your business, this is the show for you. My guests and I will show you how to build a strong mindset, a powerful body, a profitable business. Hi, I'm Brandon C. White, and this is Build a Business Success Secrets. Victoria, how did you get started in selling products on TV? Um, so you have to go way back to my journey. Um, so I, I, I'm an immigrant from South Korea, came here uh, when I was about 13 years old. And um, my parents, um, you know, we didn't have any money. So they both worked two jobs a piece. So that meant that they were out of my house by about 6, 6.30 every morning and didn't come home till it was dark. So I didn't see my parents most of the time. In fact, my, none of my siblings saw them either. So you know, as, as I grew, um, and, you know, they were very loving parents, very loving and nurturing, and they made enormous sacrifices for the future generations. So we got here. And, uh, so as I grew and I, um, you know, got all hyper-educated, I went to UCLA, USC, all these places, got my jobs. I find myself working similar hours. I was working, um, you know, from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. most of the time. It's what it's like in trying to climb the corporate ladder. You know, you're always trying to finish the job. You always have too much to do. So then I had an hour and a half commute um, from Santa Monica to Burbank. Uh, so, you know, I didn't want that life for my kids. So I had to find a different path besides the fact that I was like supplicating in these corporate, um, you know, a lot of times when you're creative, you have creative solutions. You know what your customers want. But it's mostly a, you have to go get an approval process from some like a CFO or someone like that that holds the purse strings that don't understand your customers and don't understand what makes something creative. What, what's what's the saleable creative thing? Like a lot of times you can be creative, it doesn't sell. So um, I just so wait. Could you? I, I, this could be what what Victoria is going to determine, Brandon Zinger. But I have two questions. One yeah. is, how did you? Was it hard to put yourself through school? I mean, you went to UCLA. You came here from South Korea. You were born in South Korea. Right. Did you speak English right. when you came no, here? None, none whatsoever. So how did none. you, like, what did you, you just figured it out? No, are you kidding? <laughs> Brandon, if it was that simple. Well, that's why I'm asking. I know, I know. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, for all of you who are listening right now to the sound of my voice, I know that sometimes things can, you know, we all have moments when you're like, is this it? Like, I'm going to fail or geez, I've done everything I can. And, you know, I'm just feel like right here. I haven't gotten anywhere. You know, when you get those moments when you're sort of self-pitying or especially entrepreneurs, you're like, I gave it all I've got. And, you know, I'm not getting it. I'm not getting attraction. Right. So at that point, I was looking at what is it can, what is the one thing I can do? I didn't speak English, didn't have any parents, didn't have a car. What is the one thing you can do to change your future? And for me, that one thing was, first of all, I had to learn how to speak English. Um, so uh, the way I communicated with people, like I went to school and my teacher would say, say something like, do you understand something? And I wouldn't understand something. And so when I want clarification for something, I would actually draw it out. Um, so that's how I communicated in the very beginning. And then what happened was my, I told my dad to randomly pick out, um, words from an American dictionary, like English to English dictionary. So he would just, he didn't speak English either. So he just literally randomly pick every 10th word or whatever he would circle it. And then I would, uh, write the definition of it. And then, so if you try to learn a foreign language, like if you were learning to speak, uh, let's say uh, Korean and you add a Korean word to a Korean word, there's all these other words you don't understand in the definition portion of this. So then I would list those. So I ended up with like 200 words a day and I would memorize them. And, uh, and I had him test me the next morning. So anything that I missed, then I would, it would be on the list. So that was the one thing I did. So within about two years, I was pretty proficient in English. Uh, and I found out that most Americans actually live on 2,500 words, believe it or not. <laughs> so I was way Are you trying to say that us Americans are limited compared to people from South Korea, Victoria? I'm no. joking. I'm joking. I know. I'm joking. <laughs> I know, but <laughs> if you're, if you're, if you're not, <laughs> for people listening, I'm joking. I know you are, but I think what I, how I learned it was like, um, 
I think Americans are very polite in some ways, and they have this culture that is kind of a love hate in a way that like, when I first came here, at first, I used to think like these people are just so chill, like, you know, they're so welcome and they're this and that. And yet there was a formality to them. Like, so, but I think that if, um, you know, when you were talking to somebody, you don't want to sound like you're Harvard educated. So even if you knew a word, you would try to be at that level. You know what I mean? So I've heard that 2,500 words was plenty. So I wasted all that time learning more, apparently. <laughs> well, now you're, now you're, now you're smarter. And it turns out that anything over a fourth grade reading comprehension is very hard for people to either understand or comprehend when it comes to sales marketing or communicating a message. Did you? Oh, know? I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. I have trouble understanding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Right. Like you can't read a wall of words. I just did. And the reason is I just went on this whole rant. I think the podcast came out today about people who, are doing their sales and marketing and they forget that copy is actually one of the largest parts of marketing because if right. you can't write copy that will hook the customer or stop them in the scroll or stop them in the magazine or stop them from flipping the channel right. on TV, you're done. Right. Exactly. So but I discovered all that. I mean, mostly by, uh, having things not work for me. So, <laughs> so, so you, you come here from South Korea, by the way, my sister-in-law is South Korean. Her mother came here from South Korea. So she must I, be a good person. Oh, you're a good she, company. Of course. She's a wonderful person. My <laughs> nephew is a fourth Korean. Mm -hmm. He's the world champion, uh, professional shooter of all things. I guess South Koreans are also fast. I'm hoping that he got some genes from my brother and I, but you know, you never know. You could always claim that. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, I try to. I try to latch on. I mean, his name is Maximus. How can you compete with a name called Maximus? Yeah, no, I know. And then he was born uh, in the year of the pig. Is that right? That's like a big thing in South Korea. Yeah, I think the all, I don't understand it. I, I, my uh, family was never into like the, I, I know I was born like the year of the dog or something. like. I don't understand what those things mean, really. Um, but I mean, it's fun. So it, it yeah. worked out. So you come here, you memorize effectively 2,500 words, you teach yourself English. And I mean, even living in California, I mean, I have to say that getting into UCLA is generally oh, a competitive, yeah. hard thing. Is that something that you had set your sights on because you wanted to go to a top school or was it, how did you decide and what did you study? I, uh, so going back to studying, I think um, I decided that the, the one thing I could do for myself was to learn to speak English. But the other thing I could do for myself was to let my parents know that when they left me and, the, and their, their five kids, basically I was one of five, I am one of five, um, that they would be taken care of. So I um, got up right about when they got up. You know, at that age, that was that took a lot of discipline to do that. So I got up when they got up. So with that, you know, I uh, fed them, took them to school. I took my brother on a bus, on a school, you know, city bus, dropped him off at a like a little daycare. And um, so I had all this time during the day and I had, um, you know, no friends. I didn't understand that, you know, I had responsibilities. I don't plus didn't speak English. So I had no friends. So I had all this time to study. So I poured myself into, now I didn't have to worry too much about math and world history because Korean schools actually teach that pretty early on. So English uh, literature and uh, American history kind of um, gave me a little trouble, but American history is only 200 years old. I mean, Korean history is like 10,000 years old. So, you know, it was like, it was kind of fun. And um, so I uh, did pretty well on my SAT. I got to UCLA. I worked um, about 30 hours a week with the Century City Chamber of Commerce. And I made some great connections there because, you know, that was where, where a lot of the business was happening, right between Beverly Hills and Westwood. And um, I had a great boss. Um, his name was Joel Baker, and he took such a pity on me. He knew I was a hard worker. And so he gave me um, like 30, almost 35 hours a week. I was paid hourly. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. So Saturday, I didn't have to come to work, but I did a lot of the, the brochures and all that. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I worked 10 hours a week, uh, 10 hours a day. And then I went to school Tuesday, Thursday. And what that meant was I didn't have a choice of classes. 
And I was in school from 8 a.m. to like, you know, pretty late because I took whatever classes were offered on Tuesday, Thursday, because I wanted to just get out of school. And I studied economics and um, it was a great school. I mean, great school to be, you know, beautiful scenery, great people. Um, classes were just really high caliber. And, um, but I did work off campus quite a bit. So I didn't make a lot of friends there either. So, you know, I was focused and I think in many ways, not having that ability to make friends and having that college life of, you know, sorority, all that stuff, actually, I think it kind of helped me at the end. I was like focused and getting my things done. Well, that's, a, that's exciting and that's really hard. Yeah, it's hard. So you graduate UCLA with a degree in economics and you decide that you're going to do what? Well, I wanted to get a job and I didn't get a job that I thought that I could live with for the rest of my life. So like I got jobs for as like a loan office, uh, escrow officer, loan officer, um, insurance salesperson, uh, you know, all these things that had nothing to do with creativity. So I thought, you know, in my, my dad used to say, when I would say to him, I want to, um, you know, major in art or something. And my father would say, well, have you ever heard of Stevie Wonder? And I said, well, yes. And he says, well, what does that have to do with this conversation? He says, well, do you think he went to Juilliard? I said, no. So he said, if he went to Juilliard, they probably would have ruined him. So art is something that's within you. They don't teach you that. So you don't need to go waste money learning how to, you know, basically paint or do, do whatever you have to do. So go get a real job. So I, you know, got my degree in economics. And I just, you know, in that interview process, they would ask you, um, you know, all the typical questions. And then they would ask, do you have any questions? And I would say, well, what's my typical day going to be like? And then when they told me, I was horrified. <laughs> so <laughs> I couldn't see myself do that. And the best thing to do was to go and get myself uh, an, another degree. So that's how I went to USC, which is where I got, I got my master's degree. Um, you'll find this interesting. Well, you'll find this interesting. Oh. So I um, got myself in the MBA program and I thought, marketing is like so great it's so exciting because you know i can graphics um all the different ways i can be creative that's great and then as far as uh coming up with you know like buzzwords and all that i thought that'd be really great for me so i was like all set and then when i was uh studying my classes uh, one of my professors marketing professor actually took me aside one day and told me i just wasn't going to be very good at it um, he said that I didn't really understand the nuances of marketing and that, you know, like whenever they would do case studies, for example, here's a great example. They told me, and I, they still teach this, believe it or not, uh, that the most powerful word in marketing is free. Second most powerful word in marketing is new and improved. Okay. So first of all, I said, well, if it's improved, why is it new? Um, English is my second language, but isn't that kind of contradictory to one another? Um, you know, <laughs> questions like that. And I was, when they say free, even back then, I would say, well, do, does anybody really believe anything is really free? Like, isn't that like a lie? Like, how would you build a relationship with the customer with the lie? The first thing you tell them is a lie, because it's not free. Um, so my marketing professor had issue with my ability to not understand things so so um so he alert 500 million dollars sold on tv later you obviously must have known something right but he I'm joking right so he um based on his word because i was i was a kid i didn't know what the heck i was doing so i then quickly switched my major to finance so my MBA actually is dual track finance and marketing because I kind of didn't want to still let go of then I had taken too many classes to kind of give it up. So I went out and got both degrees. And um, yeah, so years later, um, you know, the, they did invite me to come back and speak in front of, you know, because I was apparently pretty successful. Um, and, you know, yeah, that's so that that's what happened. And so, okay, it, so it, I, I threw yeah. you off track there, but I appreciate you sharing that story because I think it's important for people to understand. I mean, someone would, is listening to you or sees you on TV and thinks that it's this, you know, everybody thinks that it's the instant overnight success and oh, no, it, it's no. N nothing, there's nothing like that. So you graduate from USC with two degrees, you go out 
and now we're back to where I, I think I yeah. threw you a little okay. bit off track, but I wanted to know that you're working at, at in corporate America, but basically you're dying every day. I mean, yeah, the suffocating community, the yeah. people, the bureaucrat, bureaucrat, uh, what is it? Bureaucracy. Office politics, I would say. And yeah, so what happened was from that point, so when I got out of USC, I actually had uh, the jobs I was offered was much more elevated. You know, I got some great job offers and, but they were all in different places like New York, uh, Chicago, where usually like Wall Street because I had the finance and the marketing degree. So, um, but I couldn't leave. My parents uh, were still immigrants and trying to sort of like uh, take care of the, the rest of the siblings. I mean, they were, by that point, they were pretty, I wouldn't say well off, but they weren't like struggling with two jobs each. But I still, um, there was a hesitancy from for me to leave to another state. So I wanted to stay in um, Los Angeles and I ended up uh, with a job in a jewelry company. And I always thought that was gonna be kind of temporary. Uh, I didn't see myself as a jewelry designer. I did not see myself as a consumer marketing person by any means, but I'm a person that if you give me something, you know, I always give it my hundred percent. So, you know, I started asking simple questions like why are all the chains sold in like 18 inch, 20 inch, 24, 30, that was all standard. And it still is to this, to this day. And, um, you know, bracelets were all like size seven. And if you wanted a different length, you, they charge you 40 bucks to make a bigger one or a small one. And um, so I started asking them like, you know, have you thought that like most Korean people, for example, and I understand that there aren't that, that many Korean people living in America, but um, Asian people, there's a lot of people they can't wear a seven inch bracelet. They're wearing like six and a half, six inches. And then there are quite a few people they can't fit into a seven and a half that they need eight inches. They're not big, they just have a bigger wrist, right? So why do we have this rule? So when my boss actually did little things like offer different sizes, um, you know, 16 inches, 17 inches, um, the six and a half, seven, that was like an extra 25% of his business just by simply changing sizes. Um, you know, I was told, well, that's how we inventory our system. This, I, mean, I would tell them, but well, that's how, that's what's convenient for you, but what's convenient for our customer is a whole different thing. And you're gonna find that, you might just find that to be a really big deal, and it was. So one day uh, when I was driving home and it was a particularly hot day, like August or something, and I was like, I don't understand why I'm sitting here making my boss like a hundred, $200 million extra, just, you know, and I also like, they didn't have a designer there really uh, on staff. So I would squibble some things here and there and, and they did, they worked out and I was able to market. The one thing about that company I loved is that company was also run by a couple of immigrants and they were growing by leaps and bounds and they didn't, they let me do a lot of things that a bigger company wouldn't, you know, do, they trusted me. So it grew like crazy. Um, they had, they were the first uh, company to market, you know, Italian handmade brands and all that because he was part Italian. So um, I thought, you know what, I could do this for myself. And all I want is like 35,000 bucks a year. So I could remember this was back in 1989. I could, um, you know, spend four or five days a week, you know, six hours a day, making 30, 40 grand a year, then I can stay home with my kids. And then I can figure out what to do. And I don't need to make millions of dollars. I just need to be able to, you know, have some stability at that level. So I thought and you I were married it. at the time. Yeah. And we were both broke. Oh my God. <laughs> Where did you meet your husband? Um, believe it or not, I met him at a, a dance studio, Arthur Murray's dance studio. Um, it was like a group class. It was like a, one of those free coupon things you, you, uh, signed up for, and it was around the corner. And I was always kind of, uh, I always wanted to do it. I, you know, you see this, um, glamour of the ballroom dancing and all that. And I was like that, we were the only people under the age of 50 at that time. So we ended up getting paired all the time. <laughs> so, um, anyway, we were married, we had no money. Uh, we were both young and, um, you know, but we had, um, jobs. So he was a great emotional support, you know, person for me. He didn't, he's an, he was like an engineer and he didn't understand jewelry or creativity whatsoever, but he believed that um, with my work, work ethic and uh, my abilities, if anyone was going to make it, I could. So, uh, but we, we, he did make me promise though, if you don't make any money, okay, I'll go get a second job. But if you start losing money, then after two years, you got to shut it down. 
And I well, said, that's okay. a fair deal. Yeah, it was a, it was a very fair deal. Yeah. I didn't lose money though. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you, so what did you do? So let me just ask you this because in my experience, at least in my life as an entrepreneur and in people that I talk with fellow entrepreneurs like yourself, there's what I call this pivotal moment where you basically just do a mic drop, right? Like you yeah. walk out on this one day or this one moment or whatever it is. So did you have, do you remember that one moment? Yeah. What, and it, what, what was it? Well, I, you know, I was just talking to my boss about my raise and I think we were talking about like 5,000 bucks or something. And I got it. I got the raise and I was driving home. And even though I got it, I didn't feel good about it because I felt like, why did it take me like hours of talking to him to justify my existence? You know, after I've made him all this extra money, right? And I was giving it my heart and soul. And so I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna just go do it. And, you know, a lot of my friends were saying, you should start a side hustle. You should do, you know, I said, no, I'm just gonna quit like this that day. I gave him notice. I actually stayed for about a month or so. But I decided that, you know, this was my thing. And many people listening to me might disagree, uh, but uh, this was my thinking. In fact, if I were to do it again today, I might have done it differently. But at that time, I was thinking to myself that I was giving my company the best hours of my life, my life at that time. So you wake up in the morning, you have 24 hours a day, you're sleeping eight hours and you're in commute or whatever for three to four hours. So you have like, you know, just about few hours left and I'm giving 12 to 15 hours a day to my boss. So I thought, you know what, like, um, if I do it as a side hustle, I, I know myself, I know I would all, if I'm getting paid from someone, I'm going to give him what he deserves and it's, it never ends. So for me, my business had to be a priority. That was the only way I was going to be able to make the 35,000. So I quit, um, gave him notice, and he kept saying, are you sure you really want to do this? Um, and I said, yeah, I really want to do this. And so, you know, he did tell me your uh, chances of succeeding is pretty low uh, in, in the jewelry industry. You don't know anybody, you don't know anything, uh, and you haven't risked anything. So, you know, it's pretty low. And if you ever need to find another job, make sure you come back to me, you know, I'll, I'll have a place for you. And I told him, you know, I, I will also give you my word, I will never compete with you directly. Uh, even though I never signed an NDA or anything like that, I would never com com uh, compete with you directly. And any information I have from you would be yours, per, you know, per, per, proprietary information for you. And he did mostly chains. And to this day, that's the one thing I actually have never done. I've always, you know, bought from uh, people like him or, you know, he sold his company too, but I bought from him several years after. So um, yeah, it was that mic drop moment, which was it didn't matter if I made anybody, you know, 50 million, a hundred million, it didn't matter. You're still looking for that five, 10 grand extra. And it, I just didn't, it didn't sit with me. So. And did you save, well, I mean, in these pivotal moments, you're not always prepared, but did you have any savings stored away? I had, yeah. I had a few thousand dollars. We maxed out our credit cards. Um, the one thing great about getting a brand new degree, everybody wants to give you credit cards for free. So maxed out our credit card. Um, and I think in total, I invested like $15,000, including the credit card, to my business. And um, it, jewelry business is notorious for requiring a lot of money to start your business. It's a business that has a, some barrier to entry because of the money that you need to start up with. What do you need the money for? Inventory, um, travel, uh, making samples. Those are all, you know, um, money. And did you have a business plan? I mean, it sounds like you had a business plan in your head at some point, but did you actually write it down on a piece of paper and say, I'm going to do a jewelry business. I, Here's I my did. distribution chain. You did. I did do that. I had some time. I had just gotten out of MBA school. So uh, that was one thing that was easy to do. But let me tell you something. This is where um, I think that this is a sneaky question uh, <laughs> because not that you're trying to trick me, but I think it's it's a question that needs to be answered by, and I'm sure, I know you interview a lot of entrepreneurs. And what I learned at that very moment is this. It, I did several business plans. The first one I did, I was like, okay, well, this is how I would do it if I were go, go, gonna go get a bank loan from like an SBA loan or something. But I didn't wanna get a loan. Uh, because if you get a loan, you know, they kind of, kind of, 
rule your life for a while. You know, they control your purse strings. And I didn't think that I, would, I was going to get it. There's a whole long process. So I wanted to do it on my own. Uh, and I didn't want to do the credit card, by the way. So when I wanted, when it was my money, and it was just my money, no loans, no nothing. You know, when you go to MBA school, they teach you how to do goal setting. They teach you all these things, how to do your business plan. Okay, well, as you know, if you've ever written a business plan, it's all theory until it comes to real life, right? You're, you're making educated guesses as to what you think you're going to generate, what you think your expenses are going to be. You know, these are all guesswork. I mean, they're educated, but they're guesswork. So if you make these plans and you're in corporate America and you're running um, a division of Brandon White Enterprises and uh, com somebody comes in and does all these goals, we're going to increase our profits 30% next year or whatever, and you don't meet that goal. I mean, there, there are probably so many people in corporate America today going to their bosses this week or next month saying, why well, didn't meet their goal? There was COVID, there was this, there was that, that's about wouldn't meet the goal. Well, okay, that makes sense. You, you get to keep your job or maybe you get fired, but you don't go bankrupt. When you're a small business owner and you miss your goal by 30%, you will go bankrupt, right? So I did my business plan, but I had to learn a new way to do it. And that new way was highly, highly centered around risk management. Um, and it shaped, and when you think about that, when you think about the, the money you're risking, for example, like jewelry business back then, if you go back to 1989, I mean, you don't look old enough to be alive in 1989, but. Well, I appreciate that, but I was. <laughs> okay, well, 19, if you go back to 1989 and you looked at before the internet, before you know any, the web, the way you um, sold your products was to come up with fancy catalogs or postcards, right? And they were expensive. They were anywhere from you know eight to ten to you know, and there there was economies of scale. So whether you point five thousand or five, it was the same price, right? So it's expensive, and that was one huge expense that I had to forego. So what I did was I got myself like a Polaroid camera at first, and I would uh, take pictures. And I'd send only like four of them at a time because four of those would fit in a first class postage envelope. Okay, so I would send them like 50 of those. And I would, you know, if I, I would contact Damon Marcus Nordstrom's, you know, all these Macy's and all these, um, you know, at, in those days we had Bullock Robinson's and all that. Um, and I would send them every week. You know, here's like hot off the press, it's so new, it's not even, it didn't even make it to our catalog. You know, take a look at because I, I, you know, curated this for you based on my personal visit to your store. You know, so it it was really great because they felt like they were getting something brand new that was curated just for them that they're going to have this opportunity to buy it just just there because it's not and it's so exclusive that you you can have this. Secondly, I did this every week so that you know every vendor makes a mistake. They're usually cooked up to some vendor. You know, if they have a jewelry business, they're buying from somebody. But vendors make mistakes. And every time somebody doesn't ship or it sells out too fast that they can't fulfill it or whatever, the buyer is under a lot of pressure. And they're like, you know, this is like the second time that vendor screwed up on me. I need to find a new, I need at least find a backup vendor. And when they look for the backup vendor and they need somebody quickly, they're like, oh my God, you know, that Victoria Wick thing, when I mean, she sent that Polaroid, you know what? That name sounds familiar to me all of a sudden because she's heard that from me for 50 weeks now, right? So, so at some point, you know, there's a familiarity that goes with that. So, you know, they would call me and say, hey, you know, can you come over? So, so not, not producing any catalogs. So it kind of eliminated all my marketing expense. Um, I also went to the local stores and asked like the managers of the stores. They used to have a lot um, more say so, the, the stores like Beverly Hills stores and so forth. So they got me to do that. And then they also had me do like chunk shows with lookbooks. Like I would sketch them and, uh, you know, I would tell the customers, like individual customers, same thing, you know, for this could be like $50,000 purchase price. I mean, you don't want something that's already made for you, do you? Like, you know, here's a sketch and, you know, tell me which one you like the most. So I had the individual customers and I had the corporate customers kind of merging at both ends. And um, so I had kind of made a name for myself. I was in the Neiman's Marcus catalog a lot. And then somebody from HSN called me and asked me, you know, would you like to be 
Uh, in fact, one of my, she's now my dear friend, but she actually um, is in the infomercial world now, but she, her job at one time was to be the eyes and ears of um, the CEO at the time of HSN. So she was supposed to go look for new business. So she called me one day and said, you know, hey, um, we'd like to talk to you. And how big was your company by this point? Uh, it was several million dollars at that point. And, and you million. had a factory in, in LA? I had, um, I bought from overseas. So that's a whole other conversation. You know, I, I, I guess the first, so when you, let's go back, because this, this is a kind of, you didn't ask me this question, but it's kind of important. Um, when I got my things sketched and I was getting some bites on certain styles, right? I decided there was about eight styles that really got a lot of people interested. So I wanted to make some samples and I contacted some factories overseas, a couple of them in China, a couple of them in Korea. And, um, and I thought I had an advantage uh, with the Korean factories because they made higher quality products at that time. They were a little bit more expensive, but also I spoke the language and I understood the culture. Um, so when I was talking to them, a couple of them actually said, you know, how many, if we make the sam samples cost money, if we make the sample for you for free, how many can you sell? So being, you know, truly honest, I have no, I, I was so new to the business world. I told them I have no clue. I don't, I don't know if you, you're able to execute my designs exactly the way I do them for one thing. And secondly, I'm not sure what price are we talking about? And even if it was looked perfect and if it was cheap, I don't know how many I'm going to sell. I don't know if I can sell two or 250 or 5,000. I don't know. So what happened was, Brandon, I never got those samples. I went to the first trade show. Jewelry has a trade, Jewelry industry has a trade show in Las Vegas. I went to the Vegas show to find new vendors and, you know, whatever, to make kind of connections. And I saw my samples all over the trade show floor. So he what? sold it to my competitors. What? He sold it to, because he knew I was a little girl with no money. So... Obviously, if he made this, this, they can all, people who have been in the business a long time, they saw the, the value of my designs, how saleable they were. But I mean, if I got the order, if I got an order from, you know, Saks or whoever, he probably knew that I didn't have the money to actually kind of float th that money. So I saw the designs on the market. Were you mad? Um, oh, are you kidding? Yes, I was mad. Wouldn't you? Well, I was. You just seem so calm about it when you're talking about it that I, I would have... I mean, upset, mad, yeah, frustrated. It was, it I mean, was hundred different words, right? Yeah, it it was devastating, and I felt such a betrayal. And but I learned from that point. So what happened was, um, obviously, this guy is out of the picture. But for future guys, though, um, I actually did have. I made sure that I had copyrights. Um, I learned how to do them on my own. You can do that pretty inexpensively now. So I learned how to, in, at that time, it was like 10 bucks a design. So it was pretty cheap. So I learned how to do that. And also I, I was very careful about uh, what I said. And I, and I didn't have samples made in, from that point forward until I had some orders that I can kind of say, you know, I, I have a potential order depending on this for how many pieces. And, you know, and that continued on too. like, I still got screwed over a few times since then, because, you know, I, the fact is I didn't have the money and, the, and, and I wasn't going to lie. So, but, you know, to make a long story short, though, I ended up with some great vendors that stayed with me for 30 years since then. And that was your model was, was that you would be designed in California, manufactured somewhere yeah. else, really yeah. the Apple model. And then, right. and, and, th and then you really didn't need a ton of people on your payroll. I did not. I did have a small office and I had, uh, because we needed people to QA uh, quality control in our office and ship and pack. Uh, eventually I did job that out because when I, when my business got to be so big um, that I was literally receiving 30, 40, 50,000 pieces of jewelry uh, per shipment. Uh, we just didn't have the capacity or the bandwidth. So I contracted that out to uh, companies that specialize in helping you QA and store it and warehouse and package and ship it. Well, can we just talk about one thing? Because it's important for a lot of entrepreneurs out there as it relates to cash flow. How did you, when you got burned, you didn't have the money, somehow you figured out to either get money or get the pre-orders. How did you 
manage that first, second, third order, because that's really what kills you, right? Is is that when you start to grow fast from a cash flow perspective, you're you're having to put money down before they're landed. And then these Neiman Marcus or whoever these big people are in general, probably I would imagine are not extending 90 day terms to you. So how does that work? Right. So back then, um, and I actually have a, you know, whole philosophy about negotiating. So back then the standard terms of doing business was 30 days. I would build Neiman Marcus 30 days from the date of my invoice. And the vendors usually gave me 30 days also to pay them. So what I would tell them is, you know, look, I just went, I was very transparent. I would tell people, look, I'm a little girl. I'm not going to screw you over for anything. Um, here are the clients that I'm dealing with. Here's a p purchase order. I can go to the bank and get it factored. I can go to the bank and get a loan on this or whatever. But if you work with me, you give me 45 days to 60 days, uh, just for the next, you know, six months, I'm going to remember who made me successful and I'm going to remember who helped me. So you can either be that person and be on a success train. I mean, jewelry industry is a dinosaur. People have been selling jewelry for 2000 years. Things haven't changed. And now 89 was the beginning of the Ronald Reagan recession. In 80, 90, 91 was a pretty tough, and it actually ended bottomed out in 94 with the whole California real estate you know, meltdown. So I told them things are tough out here. And if you want to continue doing everything the same way it was for the last 500 years, go do it. But if you want somebody with whole new, new fresh blood. Now, back in 89, let's go back to what was happening in the macroeconomics. Um, I guess that was a little fancy term, but what was happening in the economy was this. The, we were the first generation of people going to work, uh, females going to work in a management capacity. Okay, before females were working, but you know, they didn't try to break the glass ceiling. We didn't have chief merchandise, anything. We didn't have chief whatever at that time. So we were the first generation of women who were hyper-educated, who were equally educated as men, and they were working in workplaces. Jewelry was always sold nighttime jewelry, daytime jewelry. Nighttime jewelry was like fancy diamonds, you know, uh, the glitzy stuff you wore for your social events. Daytime jewelry was pretty junky, plastic jewelry, things that turned on you uh, because nobody really wanted that. So in the workplace, when do you remember a lot of women who went to work? I mean, I remember when a lot of us went to work in like pencil skirts, you know, wool pencil tailored skirts with the white like shirt like men would. And we had little pumps and stockings, okay? We, were, we all looked like we were uniform salespeople. So women who wanted a look that was polished, that was elegant, uh, slightly understated, but made you look like you were successful, you know what you were doing. There was nothing like that. So when in the my mass produced pieces, I kind of specialize in that affordable pieces that could be heirloom, but still you could have some variety and it made you successful. You know, also in workplace, you can't go up to somebody and say, you know, why do you want a job? Brandon, you're going to ask me, you know, why do you want to work, at, work here? And I can't go and say, well, Brandon, can you look at me? I'm successful. I'm pretty. I'm smart. I can do everything that I, if you did that, you would never go get a job. But if you had all the right pieces that said you were successful and elegant, you're going to represent your company really well, you were noticed, right? So in my marketing packages, I actually would, would say those things, you know, all the things that you don't, you can't say about yourself, your jewelry can. So that's a great marketing line. Yeah. So what happened was, thank you. So what happened was I was like burning my candles at all ends and I was telling them, look, how many people do you know that's talking to Saks and Neiman Marcus, you're getting orders and it's not, we're not talking huge amount of money here. So you can either help me 45 days and, you know, deliver it on time. And so, and then I would also tell my buyers at those companies, you know, look, I really, I'm a small company, you know, I, and all the buyers want to be the person who discovered the next new it thing. So, you know, I was like that new it thing. So I would tell them whatever you could do to call your, you know, um, uh, accounts payroll people and to make sure like my check was right on money. So I had a, a really great tr track, track record in sales as well as in from the vendor side. So pretty soon, I mean, I, I think by the time I got to HSN, I was already doing business with like all the cruise lines. I was on Princess Cruises, Royal Cru Cruise Line, Celebrity, Holland America, I mean, all that. 
uh, many department stores. Um, I was in duty free uh, shops all over the airports. Um, on in flight duty free, I was on like 30 different airlines. I had all these uh, representation in uh, Europe, Asia. So by the time HSN called me, it was like, who are you? Like, why, why would I want to go on TV? So, well, and, and let me, I just want to ask, were you using the same techniques or was it this flywheel that you did the, I mean, that was an absolutely incredibly brilliant thing to say that you were curated. And I think another important point you <laughs> that another important point you made that I want to point out to everybody is you said 50 weeks and it could have been 50 weeks, but it could have been a hundred weeks. I don't know. Yeah, you, yeah. you know, it didn't happen overnight. But did you use that same tactic with everybody else? Or was it once you got that break that you were just waiting for that that just steamrolled into these other opportunities? Both. I still use the tactic today. Um, so when I, you know, talk to anybody new, I don't go in with all the things I could do. I do the homework. I figure out who their customers are. I figure out what what they are currently selling and where there is a void, and I would curate the twelve pieces. You know, here are the twelve pieces that I think I would. You know, my center thing is I would go to a department store and I'd say, "Look, I you know did my homework. I stood in front of your store number five or you know your uh, South Coast Plaza store for two days, watched people shop, watched women after women after women going and trying out the bracelet, but she didn't buy it. So I then checked out your competitors." And I find that, you know, whoever's supplying your basics, studs, earrings are doing a great job. But when it comes to the bracelets, you got a problem here. And here's potentially what could be wrong with it. And here's, you know, what I can supply you. And just give me 36 inches of space. And I, you know, so we'll, we'll learn. And usually, you know, I usually I end up getting the business. I end up moving everybody else out, I end up taking the whole, whole thing eventually because I figure out what it, you know, I'm not somebody who's just going to let everybody else do the, do the business. But I believe, you know, in marketing now, this whole buzzword of niching down, you know, be focused. And I think I practiced that going back to 89 because I couldn't, I didn't have the bandwidth to compete with everybody on everything. So I started with eight bangles. Then I went to tennis bracelets, which was a huge thing for a while. Um, then I went to other things. And so now I have the freedom to do what I really want to do, but I, I did stick to the principle. Some of those basic principles that worked for me back in 89, still working today, like flawlessly, because they are basic, they're basic, just great habits. You know, I mean, even now when I send something, if I'm sending you a letter and say, um, you know, I want to sell you, I don't know, a real estate, let's say I want to sell you an Island. <laughs> which I don't have, by the way. <laughs> and I say, Brandon, I have this wonderful island that, you know, I'm a, I'm a broker for such and such company. And I've heard that you're, you know, you have the financial means and you've been looking for an island. You may not be looking for one, but if you ever was, this is great. I send a picture. Somebody at that level, I would probably send it FedEx. And then I would also send them a first class mail. And I would send them an email because that way they're getting it. They're getting the three shots. The first class mail is still coming there, but it's like by the time they pick up the phone, they feel like they've talked to you. They feel like, you know what? Maybe this woman's right. You know, that island's only 10 million. And, you know, maybe that is a good investment. I don't know who to talk to. You know what? She's she's pretty, pretty well known. She has to be because I've heard her name before. You know, this is like repetition. It, it, does, it, it does work. I will admit you did that. I get I get a lot of requests. I'm not saying this podcast super popular it gotten popular amazingly after a year right of keep publishing but um you knew you knew everything and most of the people <laughs> and i was like i need to go actually look into this victoria lady and i was like oh my god is this real is this real first of all and then i did some research and you had given me and we made it really easy yeah. So, you, and and I think I think anybody listening out there, I think the lesson here is is that if you do your homework, yeah, and you make it easy for that person, I keep I've always said this, Victoria. I don't know if people listen to me or not. I have no idea. But here's what I do know from a psychology background: is motivation won't work. You got to right. make it easy. And if you make it easy, 
eventually, I don't want to say you'll break them, but you did. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you, you'll yeah. get there, right? You'll get that break. You will. And I think that uh, the lesson, you know, I just want to state that I, uh, everything, we've, we've just had a, such a great time talking. Um, I want to tell you that there's, I come with so much gratitude because my career, like when I hear other people read my bio when I'm speaking or something, since it's almost like they're talking about somebody else because I never intended to be rich or famous or being on TV or anything. You know, I just wanted to make 35 grand so I could spend time with my kids. Um, so I come to this network or, you know, to this podcast, any, anywhere I go, I come with a lot of gratitude and I know a piece of luck was probably involved um, as well. Well, but, no, you were prepared. I'm so grateful to have you to be <laughs> honest. I was like, can I actually, I, cause I watch all this stuff. We, you know, we were yeah. talking earlier. I watched this stuff and I, I was like, wow, this is, this is a lady who has created this hundred million, multi hundred million dollar empire selling jewelry and knows all this stuff. So I'm, I am actually super grateful that you even reached out and, yeah, and, yeah. and shared the story, but we're not done yet. So because HSN calls you and when most people get a call from HSN today, they're over the moon, but you, it sounds like we're questioning if you should even consider going there. Yeah, at the time, uh, my life was so good at the time. So, you know, I, had, as I said, I didn't even know HSN existed at that time. You know, they were a lot smaller company and HSN's journey is a whole, I mean, amazing journey as a company as well. But at that time, you know, I was in all the major department stores worldwide. I was in all the duty-free stores. You know, if you remember, airline travel used to be kind of a glamorous thing. So, you know, especially first class airline travel. So I was in all the different airlines. And um, so when HSN called me, I was like, you know, who are they? And like, how is that going to impact the rest of my business? So if I were selling HSN, it didn't, you know, their average price point for jewelry was like, you know, 20, 30 bucks. And if I couldn't sell it there, how am I going to sell my stuff at Neiman Marcus for 500 to a thousand bucks? Right. So that was a really legitimate concern. So it had the potential to um, maybe diminish my career or affect, impact some customers for sure, because there used to be this snob factor of the, the, the Neiman's and Sachs and, you know, people who bought those wouldn't, wouldn't go to, you know, some, something lower tier. So that was a concern. Um, so, you know, I had to really think about how that's going to work. And, but there was one thing that really was attractive uh, for me to about the whole HSN thing. And that was, by that point, I was traveling millions of miles on airlines. If I, you know, I was going to London a couple of times a year, I was going to, um, you know, and I did all the European uh, cities. I went going to Asia uh, like three or four times a year because I was going there for sourcing plus also for my, uh, my customers. I had department store customers there as well in Tokyo and in South Korea. Then you uh, add into the two or three trade shows here plus market week, which happens in New York. You know, I was, I, I then at that point, it was just at the point where I was just really questioning myself about, okay, I started my business so I can spend more time with my family. And now I'm working more than I ever imagined. And the money is really good, but like how much money do I really need? And is this now getting me back to my childhood where when my kids at that point were really, you know, like preteens and you're like, this is when they really are most impressionable. And this was almost the same age. And I thought, no, I have to like, you know, put a stop to this. So luckily we always lived below, well, well below our means, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you never know when you have a rainy day, especially in a, you know, creative field like I was. So we've always saved money. And when I said, I didn't want to go travel. And I was already starting to shed some of the borderline customers that were starting to cause me problems, like too tight of a deadline and all that. Then when they called me, I thought, you know what, if this thing actually, if I can make this work, I would only have to go from LA to Tampa once a month. And I would make almost the same volume, but I just didn't know how to make that work. But I thought that would be really amazing. So, um, you know, after I think a few visits to back and forth, uh, they made it pretty easy for me. But going back to your um, summary about making it easy, I think that entrepreneurs 
And even if you're like struggling at a job right now, make it easy for your customers. And I know like older entrepreneurs who, who say, well, you know, I have author friends who are like, I don't want to be on social media. I don't understand it. You know, Facebook is so old. And I, I, I took a friend one time and said, you know what? You just said the word I like three times, okay? This isn't about you. This is about your customers. If you have this wonderful book that you just wrote, okay? You have so much to share. But if your customers have to go to 50 different clicks to find you, you're making it impossible for them to even love your book, love you or love your book. Make it easy for them to find you. That's the only thing they're asking you to do. So, you know, um, and while I'm at the subject, um, the one thing I'll tell you about TV, and it doesn't matter where you go. I'm currently on Shop HQ. It doesn't matter where you go. I, and I'm going to tell you that the people that last on TV versus people who don't last on TV. And it, this may be very subtle, but here's the thing. If you make it about you and you talk about you and you know we're told all the time to be relatable, to do all those things. So some of those people come on and they'll say, you know, I designed this wonderful piece of jewelry, designed this wonderful collection. And, you know, I wore this out to, you know, um, a fabulous Oscar party in Beverly Hills. And I was on a yacht with a bunch of people and they were all like, you know, this star, movie star, that movie star. And, and they were all complimenting on me. And um, so I think you're just gonna love it. Okay, that's one way to present your jewelry. So, so this person just said the word like, I love this. I was seen, I'm rubbing shoulders with whoever like six different times. I go on TV and I will say something like, you know what? Don't you guys love it that we are finally coming out of COVID and summer is here because summer is when we all go out and just experience life. This is summer fun. You know, you get to experience life with your friends and family. Your kids are from home from school. And I designed the most fabulous jewelry that you can share the wonderful memories with your family. So when you wear this to your barbecue, when you wear this on a lake, you know, you know, with your kids and you're going to pick up your kids from the field trip or whatever, and everybody's drooling over your jewelry and knowing that you didn't spend a fortune on this, it's going to have to make you look great. You know, what are the best thing about this too, is when you're done from this earth and you are gone, somebody from your family is going to remember your personality, how smart you are, how elegant you are. So I'm going to tell you something. Shop HQ makes this so easy for you. You can pay like six bucks today and get at home and start enjoying life with the people that matter to you the most. So I use the word you. So I would argue the most powerful word in marketing is the word you. Not free, not new and improved contradictory words, by the way. <laughs> I'm smiling because you're so good. Because that is, that is, I think uh, one of the things, Victoria, that I tell entrepreneurs is, well, I don't tell them, sometimes I react to them, is I'll get pitched because they want right. money from investor, which is a whole different discussion that you and I, you touched on and really summed it up. You probably took all the wind out of my sails that you summed it up in I 30 not. seconds. No, I'm kidding. Is that, hey, look, if you take money, understand they're going to have some control of your company. Right. But at the end you of the do. day, there's no, there, there's no debate in that. I mean, that's, that's the truth. And they'll start, they'll start by talking about themselves. And right. what I say, and I learned this the hard way. I am raising my hand right now and saying, I was always guilt. I say always, I was guilty for a really long time. There's actually a guy who's, uh, we were on a sales call for a really big, it was, it's like a fortune 20 company account. And I, pitched myself because I thought that I needed to establish my credibility. And right. he pulled me aside. He said, in the next two meetings, which it was this whole day affair we were going through, he said, just tell them the problem you're solving, that right. we're solving for them. And only talk about your background if they ask, because they are either being polite and interested, or they want to know what your background is. And I right. did that. And actually, I didn't even like this guy I was on the sales call with, candidly, but I, I'm open to feedback. I did that and it worked. And what I tell entrepreneurs is never start your pitch with uh, your background, you're this. I know. So, tell them the, solve, the problem you're solving. And I, I'm, I'm, 
I'm saying this to you, but the listeners out there, because that's what you just did in that last pitch is you solved a problem for them about how they are going to feel important, how, right. how they're going to feel good, how they're going to be the center of attention, how their right. family is going to save this piece of jewelry and think of them. It's all about them all about them yeah exactly and just like this show is all about our audience right so i think that if you watch um you know average brand on tv last like two shows because they think just like you they think that they have to establish authority so they will talk about you know um i won like 40 different awards and i want this i want that and you're like you know what okay well so like the audience is listening going like so what's in it for me and then, you know, what's really bad is, so those of us who have like the big today special value, you have to come back, you know, you, you're on like several times a day. So each time you'll go on. So I had a caller one time call me and said, you know what, I, um, everything that I ever thought about you, you just validated because when she called me on the testimonial line, you know, I said, oh my God, how is your family? And she said, everything that I ever thought about you, you just validated because a lot of the guests go on and talk about you know, uh, they graduated from such and such design school, they won this award. And she goes, I feel like telling them, you told us already that last month and this morning and this afternoon, like what else is new? <laughs> so I don't even, you know, I don't even go there, but I think for entrepreneurs, when you start talking, like I just did, which is you, you are selfless, you don't matter in this equation. Okay. You are just the, the agent delivering the, the problem solving solution. I mean, the other thing too, is when you're talking about inventing a pro uh, product, think about why does your product even need to exist in the first place? So in my jewelry, I'm talking jewelry. Nobody needs jewelry for human survival, right? Yet I was still looking at where's the void, where's the problem? The problem was if you're a professional working woman who just started to make some really good money and you need to differentiate yourself in a sea of, uh, you know, like a uniformed woman, how do I find ways to say that I'm polished and I'm successful, but I'm still, you know, I have great taste and I'm understated. There was no jewelry like that. And so I upped it by offering that style that's timeless, but I, I did it in silver. So if you do it in silver, there is silver and gold last a lifetime. So it's heirloom quality and price point was affordable. So they could, you know, kind of have a nice wardrobe going on. And then if they wanted to come to my private side and they wanted to have some like a, a wedding ring made or something like that, you know, then they could spend some big money. So I had a, I had a frictionless transition to, um, you know, opening price point to, you know, they, they just, so I have a huge, you know, millions of women who have bought pieces from me that kind of went through this whole journey with me. So they are now either nearing retirement or they're entrepreneurs themselves, or they are now recommending my jewelry to their, to their, you know, to their kids and the grandkids. So I, if there's one thing that I want to impart with everybody who's listening is the entrepreneurship journey is not easy by any means, but it would be a lot simpler if you make it about somebody other than yourself. Because, because it, it just it, it just makes it so much easier. It makes everything make sense. Like when you are communicating with them, understanding who you're talking to. And when I say it's about them, well, who are them? Think about like a person. If you say like, you know, my customers are, let's say, you know, leaders in the community. Well, who are they? What do they lead? Because if they're leading Girl Scouts or whatever, you would have a different um, message than somebody who's leading, you know, a different group, a senior citizens group. So, you know, be very specific and go all in and give them truly more than what they expect. And, you know, I just blow their mind out of the water about like, oh my God, I'm, I thought I was going to get this and I got that and this and that and that, because, you know, that's how you multiply and amplify. Right. So, yeah. So you really, I mean, I'm thinking as I'm listening to you, you basically understood your customer avatar better than any of your competitors, number one. And number two, you knew what your value ladder was, which was low price entry point at mass market and still right. today. And you can come on a journey with me and, and have a private collection, which then moves them up 
even maybe even beyond, beyond but yeah. maybe even into the Neiman Marcus realm, but then even more into yeah. this private Victoria experience that's priced premium, but you get a premium product and you're going to feel really good about. Absolutely. So my uh, opening price point at HSN in 1998, the average price point was 123. So it was uh, half 14 karat gold, half um, uh, silver in the same show. You know, so I, we would make it very clear which ones were. Uh, Neiman and Marcus, my average price point was about five, five ninety five, six hundred dollars. And then my private clients, the people that came sat one on one with me, the average price point then was fifteen thousand. So basic, and you know, there was plenty that paid fifty, you know, hundred thousand, but average price point, uh, you know, the median price point was fifteen thousand. So it was pretty frictionless uh, in that way. But going back to um, what you touched on earlier, and I'm sorry, I'm jumping a little bit back and forth, but I just remember this point. Why I had that, why I had such a diverse price point was this. The one thing I did learn from the MBA school that I, um, I would actually was say was maybe not worth the whole thing, but worth a lot of it was the one thing they teach you is don't let any customer be more than 10% of your total business because somebody who's more than 10% of your uh, business will, is going to eventually control your life. So that's why I had the healthy mix of various price points and also the different kinds of customers. So that if, you know, I mean, HSN was great, but if they said, you know what, Victoria, you're not working for me, bye-bye, it wouldn't make, make, have made a whole a lot of difference because I had such a rock solid wall around my customer base, so. So when you went on TV, because you obviously, I mean, anybody can Google you and you can see that your your shows and your videos and things like that. Were you scared? I mean, you oh, lasted, yes. I say you lasted. I mean, you, you I'm did. still on, yeah. You, you're still on. You did a decade at, at Home Shopping Network and then wh where you are now. Um, what was the, I mean, was the secret that you were talking about them? I mean, you had no, I, unless I missed it, and I know I didn't fall asleep because it was a very engaging conversation. <laughs> it, it, it is, is there was no TV training here. Right. Uh, there's, I mean, and that can be a very intimidating thing for somebody. I do want to, I'm like you, I, I just, one point I want to say before we move on to this, but I, I want to talk about this is, is that I want to say to any listeners out there who does talk about themselves, I think Victoria, I'm interested in, in your feedback on this. I don't think they that all of us or I even I did it or other people do it because they're ego maniacs in that sense. I think right. Yeah. I think it's a lot of insecurities in us that come out because we're doing such a hard thing yeah. that we want yeah. people to know that they are getting this product. I just wanted to say that because I, I don't want it to come across somebody out there could say, well, you know, I'm not an ego. You know, man, actually, it's not big. I mean, we as entrepreneurs, you got to have an ego, but it's a lot of insecurities of why that happens. And 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 you really have to just be able to put those insecurities behind and, and have utmost confidence that the problem you're solving is on the mark. Yeah, I think um, I will say that I have seen some people that are very egotistical there on TV and they think they're successful in other parts of their, their lives, especially a lot of celebs, you know, come from Hollywood and they talk about how, you know, they are doing this or that. And that's part of their branding, a lot of them, to be frank. It just doesn't work on uh, home shopping or, you know, or QVC. Then you have other entrepreneurs who believe that, oh my God, you know, I'm getting this huge meeting with the buyer or, you know, uh, investors or whoever, and um, I need to establish my expert authority really quickly. So I need to let them know, you know, I acquired this degree and that degree, and I got this award and all that award so that they think that I'm a bigger deal than what I appear to be right now, because they don't know me, I, you know, I'm not Googleable. And I think that there is a fine line um, that you do need to establish your expert authority. And I would say that the best way you do it is your first opening line. If you say, for example, you're doing a webinar and like I just did this today, I'm doing a free webinar for a friend of mine um, and she hasn't decided which date yet, but I'm doing it for her for free. And if you said 
you know, come join Victoria Wick on such and such day. You know, she did this, 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 that, that. She does all of this stuff. You know, she, um, you know, was on HSN and she was on, you know, she's on Shop HQ. She did this and all of that. And, and she'll be discussing these. Well, you know what? That's okay. But if you started out, instead of that, you started out saying, you know what? Are, are you tired of worrying about what's, what's, what's going to come out next? Are you tired of, of working spinning your wheels faster and faster to get less and less. You know, are you tired of all of this? Well, guess what? There are some really simple things you could do for yourself today to change that dynamic. So by understanding who you're talking, doing your homework, understanding who your audience is, you know, if I went to some meeting and I said, you know, I, I'm a designer, I want all of this awards. Instead of that, if I went to a bio and said, you know what? I did all this homework, I, you know, shopped, uh, you know, Bloomingdale's and Saks and this and Norton Taylor, all these stores. And I noticed that you're doing really well in this and you're doing really well in this, but I really see that there is where your weakness is, you know, right here. And let me just explain to you what I can do to help you. And by the way, you know, if you're interested, here's what my company does. And so, like you said so eloquently, if you identify that problem correctly, all of us, nobody wants to admit you got a problem, but if you really are hurting for something, okay, if you're really hurting, and that, that was a true story, by the way, in, uh, it was a Macy's buyer, I went in, and I mean, I was a total, she was like my first uh, major buyer, that department store buyer, that bought anything, and I told her, you know, here's, I noticed that there were, you know, literally I saw so many people I didn't see a single bracelet purchase but a lot of people tried it on so you know I watched them and she said you know what you're so right that is the only area that I haven't been able to crack I don't know why it is this is my third vendor in that category and I just can't do it and I know everybody else around me is just having a heyday on this thing like there's a whole trend going on so just by identifying that you know, and then she asked me after about 30 minutes. So like, I, I do business with this company, company A, company B. Tell me like one reason why I should do business with you. I want to do business with you, but I need, in order for me to bring in a whole new vendor, set you up as a vendor, I have to justify this to my boss. That's what she told me. So I said, you know what? I don't know what those other people do. Like, I think I know what they do, but why don't you ask them what they do? Because I don't want to step out, you know, I don't want to say anything, but let me tell you what I do and how I can help you. Because I'd rather talk about me, what my company can do. So she signed me on. And, you know, pretty soon I did move. I did get all of the other businesses from her. So expert authority, if you do, you know, it's like um, my kids play tennis, competitive tennis. And the times when they don't practice, you know, they, they wanted to go watch video games or whatever, you know, they were at national level tennis tournament. If they're not ready, they'll draw somebody who's like ranked 28 or something, they're petrified, okay? But when they're ready and they've scoped out their opponent, every single tree of their whole thing, and they've scoped them out, they've, they've you know, practiced their weakness, all that stuff. You know, I remember one time my daughter drew like the number one seed at the girl 16 or something. She's like, you know what, bring it on. Okay, I, I got this for the, so that's how, the confidence comes with preparation, right? And you are never going to be sorry by doing too much preparation. It's like when I came on your show, I listened to your, your latest episode and I listened to like the middle episode. I listened to the short one and the long one to see like, you know, I mean, does he get tired in the middle? Like what, what happens? You want to- what, what, what was your assessment? Do I get tired in the middle? I don't no, know. No, you don't. Actually- <laughs> Actually, I really enjoyed listening to it because usually I will skip around because, you know, I don't have unlimited amount of time. I'll skip around to see how they get yeah, the beginning, the middle and the end. But I mean, you were very engaging. I think that um, you have such a conversational style, but you also have that amazing knack of focusing on a problem that's important. It's just, it's, just, it's like, you know, if you're reading a whole volumes of something, you you pluck out the important things and kind of um, drill on that. So I think that was really, um, you know, really nice. And you you make it easy for the guests to be themselves and be authentic. And, you know, you're not like, um, no, I think it's, I think you're good. You keep well, let's talk about you. So you're going on TV. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So you're on TV for the first time. And how, I mean, look, I mean, speaking to you clearly, 
you have this magic about you that you can figure these things out by really get, uh, what should I say? You really observe reality and, and, and understand where, not, not what you want to see, but what is there in the dynamic is what I, you have this unique knack right. is to yeah. see that dynamic. So how did you do that? Because I mean, I, I've been on sets. Uh, I've been on TV for fishing shows back in the day on ESPN and things like that, but it's very different. We're in nature. I mean, yeah. it's a little bit set up. You might be a little bit yeah. nervous, but it's sort of easy because you're rolling this thing and you get, you catch fish or you don't. Uh, there's a little pressure to catch right. fish. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want that pressure. <laughs> um, but you you're catching fish. You're fishing, but you're on this made up set. I mean, you know, it's a yeah, real yeah. TV set, yeah. and there's this camera in your face, and you have to imagine that there's millions of people watching in the home. But I can imagine that's very intimidating, and that, I mean, how did you learn how to do this formula on TV? Because there is a formula. Well, you know, when I first got on, I was absolutely petrified. They had to, they, they gave me a whole thing about what's going to happen. You're going to have five or six different cameras. You know, they went through the whole thing. And I called them um, at three o'clock. I was supposed to go on at 7 p.m. I called them at three o'clock and I said, look, look I'm throwing up. Um, I'm having butterflies. I, I can't breathe. I don't think I can go on tonight. So they said, well, you know, you don't really have to go on, but come to the set, you know, and um, you just have to sit next to the host and let her do all the talking. You just have to sit. That's what they told me. So I went, of course, she started asking questions and I had to answer the question, but they had people like with um, like, like those white boards that say, look this way. And they would have these people like walk around and jump up and down. Cause I didn't know what, what camera to look at. Uh, I was really petrified about, because it's live um, about what I might say that sounded really stupid. But luckily, the host was very good, and she um, asked questions only about the product, not about how much it costs or anything. Like that, only, but so I was able to explain my designs, and luckily, things sold out so fast. So about an hour and twenty minutes into a two-hour show, they said to me, um, "You sold out of everything, so we're going to have to get you off of uh, of this now." You know, thank you so much for coming by, and you know, so they went to another programming. So I thought. Just on the set, just like that. Set. Like, hey, yeah, Victoria, this set. has been great. Thank you so much. Yeah. We sold out. You're done. You're done. So I was like, okay. So they had a thing called the walk of shame, which is they used to take you off if you didn't meet your dollars per minute. I didn't know anything about this. So you had to walk from the set through the customer service. Like the, all the operators were there, you know, at that time. And you have to walk through all that to the green room. And I'm walking there and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I probably said some of the stupidest things there ever was. And the product probably sucked. So I'm getting off air. And then I thought to myself, oh my God, my poor buyer and the, this woman who contacted me for all those years, like, I'm like, what's going to happen to them? Because my life wasn't going to change very much, but I felt horrible about that. Then when I got to the green room, all of the executives, everybody just had balloons up and they were like cheering up and down. And I, I looked at them like, what's going on? And they said, you sold out of everything. And I said, I did. And they said, yes. I said, so when they have those numbers at the bottom, like how many sold, is that like real numbers? And they said, yeah, of course it's real numbers. In fact, it's delayed because all the people that are in the process until the credit card checks, you don't, you're not even counted there. So they're like, yeah, it's delayed. And you know, it's, you sold out of everything. So I said, well, so what did they do with the rest of the airtime? So they said, you know, they brought some other jewelry line. They were actually writing the shows like the minute I got on because they could tell how fast it was going. So that was my first show. And, you know, when they would ask me things like, well, you know, I love this and I love that. And, you know, would you wear two, would you wear two different bracelets, two bracelets, you know, stacked up together and wear that? And I would say, well, I personally wouldn't because, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty um, plain Jane. And my host would look at me like, is this woman for real? Because they want to <laughs> they want to sell wanna more. Like, they want to sell more. So but. It's a process and believe it or not, even now when I am not prepared, like if I'm not prepared, I'm not prepared if they throw, throw like a last minute show on me or something. And, um, and I'm not perfectly familiar with which items are gonna fit in that show. I still get nervous because you are judged on a dollars per minute and you, you know, you're not sure how smooth it's gonna be, how choppy you're gonna be talking. 
And again, I respect my customers so much that I try to do a lot of homework on them as well. Like who's watching at what time of the day. Um, you do get a little bit of demographics and uh, the kind of words they want to hear because on TV, your call lines go up and down based, I mean, as you were talking. So my producer would tell me, oh my God, you know, when you talked about the soccer mom and this and that, like the lines went through the roof in California and try to say that again, you know, something like that. So I knew that I had soccer moms listening, right? So what do soccer moms wear? So, you know, they're telling me to go say that again, but in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, I got the soccer moms from California. I got, you know, the, the millennials coming back from the bar at one o'clock in the morning. So like every time they tell me something, I would make notes. And when I design jewelry, I would design it with those things in mind. And so next time I talk about, hey, I designed this for all your soccer moms. You know, I know like when you're watching your kids play and you're walking from one field to the next and your, your you know, head is like turning and everybody's looking at you. I know that makes you feel good. And it's only costing you 20 bucks today. So, you know, so there are many different ways you can still connect with people. But again, you probably heard me doing just, you know, I'm not gonna, I really don't want to sound like I'm braggadocious by any means, but if somebody can take a day off from all that, I probably could. I mean, in the TV world, my name means something, but I don't, I don't take that day off. If I'm on, I do the homework. I do the homework every day, the way I did it day one today, if not probably more because I have more means to do the homework today. So I think that's the lesson, you know, um, but it's enjoyable homework. I, I love finding about my customers. I love that, you know, when they tell me what they want to hear from me, what they want to see from me. Um, so if, if, because I really love what I do, I don't really feel like it's a whole lot of work, but if you do your homework and the other thing too, is if you're listening to my voice right now and you're like, you know, I, I hear this a lot because I've been interviewed quite a few times, people would say to me, well, how did you do this? How did you do that? You know, people say, well, well, but Victoria, you're you, you're so poised, you're this, you're that, or you have a following. Well, I didn't have any of that before. You know, you, you, you have to start from, we all came here with nothing and you have to start someplace and you're all good. You just have to start doing that one thing that every day, think about the, I don't care what happens, the one thing you could do to change your future and that will open up to four things tomorrow and on and on. Cause you, you just heard my journey. I mean, I started with sketching because I couldn't, you know, it was questionable if I could even afford the sketching stuff because the sketching stuff, like the watercolors were pretty expensive, by the way. If you do high, high quality watercolors, they're, you know, they're like 20 bucks a tube. Um, so yeah, you know, what I want to do is coming on these shows is, it, as you said earlier, motivation, encouragement, inspiration, all of those are great words but action changes things. And making it easy. Yeah. That's a, it's an incredible journey that you had and you're still on TV today. On Shop HQ. Yeah. Shop Shop, HQ. It's about once a month. Yeah. What, what made you just out of curiosity? What, what was it economics? Was it just cycles uh, switch from HSN to. <laughs> so many people have asked me that. Um, well, so, how could I not? Yeah. Yeah. So I went to HSN. I had, uh, when, my, when my contract was up the first time in 2004, I retired. I wanted to spend more time at home uh, with my kids. You know, I've made money. And I also felt like in this creative field that I'm in, you know, a designer can only be so hot for so many years. And I thought, I'm just going to go out at, at the high. Uh, when I try to retire, uh, it lasted for, and you know, when you when your brand is that big, when you retire, there's still all that residual inventory that you have to help them clean up and all that. So I was kind of doing all that. And um, I didn't really love retirement that much. I didn't have a whole lot of other things to do. And they made it very easy. They, at that point was the first time they actually made it so that I didn't have to do so much uh, financial risk of, you know, producing the stuff and all the production end of the things. So they kind of hooked me up with the manufacturer that was going to do more of the financial risk portion of this. They made it pretty easy for me. And at that point, all I had to do was kind of sketch uh, and, you know, a lot of the logistical stuff was taken off of my plate. So I was able to do more of the things that I love to do. So my brand actually doubled at that point. Um, 
my contract was up again in, uh, in 20, expired in 2015 again. And I tried to retire again, 2015. And um, so, you know, it was like a two year uh, cleaning up uh, inventory, trying to figure out how do we still work without signing another lengthy contract. So I, I retired for good in 2017. And I wrote a fiction called uh, Shattered Sky, 94,000 word uh, Shattered Sky. And when I presented it to all of the writers conferences and, you know, and I told, I'm a very honest person. So I told people, look, don't waste time on me because I've heard that first time writers books suck and my problem, mine probably does too. So don't waste time on me. But what I want to do is I like to get some feedback. So I want to get rid of my first book. I mean, you know, I'm going to publish an ugly looking book and then I'm going to go to the second book. So I, when I talk to people, so many of them in the writing community actually recognized me and my brand. And, you know, there were a couple of those editors, my fans, they're like, why aren't you writing a memoir? And I said, well, my memoir would be very boring. First of all, I could be really interesting for about three chapters, but beyond that, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't have any scandals or anything. So it's probably not going to be all that interesting. So I didn't want to do it, but um, after 2017, I wrote that book. My daughter got married in 2017. So I was able to design like a killer wedding. I mean, we designed everything from the floors to the tables to you name it. It was at San Ysidro Ranch. Uh, to, you know, if you look it up, it's the America's number one resort. We like took it over and did the whole thing. It was great. And then in 2018, uh, at the end of 2017, I uh, a very dear friend of mine was a CEO of Shop HQ. And he actually helped me build my, my business at HSN. And he had come out of retirement. Uh, he went from HSN to becoming a, a CEO of Tommy Helfiger. And then he went to Shop HQ. And he said, you know what, Victoria? I would rather have a little bit of you than none. And I know you're in retirement. So we're not going to like demand a lot of hours from you. But we'd like you to come um, when it's you know just on a, like a smaller schedule. So that was very attractive to me. So that's where I'm at now. Then I started my podcast, Million Dollar Hobbies, to be in a way to connect with a lot of my viewers. I think there are about 15 million viewers that have bought a piece or two from me over the last 30 years. So I wanted to reconnect with them and also inspire other people to just really chase your dream. Because you know, when I look at my, my dream, when I first came to America, my dream was to be able to buy an old Camaro. Uh, because I, I saw a guy drive a Camaro and I thought, oh, well, that's really cool. Like if I could have that, that would be like my whole life's mission. Um, and from that to, you know, finding my own apartment of my own, like where I could pay on my own rent. And that was my second mission. And then the 35,000 bucks a year. So, you know, you take one little action, it, it just blossoms. And, um, and now I want to do good. I want to share my experiences, not just the good parts, but I went over a lot of the ugly parts today with you. And uh, there are uglier parts, which I don't want to burden people with. But really, I think that I just want you to all know that everything that you want in your life is within you, but you have to take action and you have to want to do it. And all of us have to start someplace. And that starting point, I mean, today you could just redefine your dream. I mean, I, all of us are trying to shift our priorities, right? And it, let me just explain to you what I'm saying, because sometimes words like what I have could ring hollow. So, and I'm gonna use this example. If you say, you know what? Okay, I just gained a few pounds during COVID. So I'm gonna lose some weight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be healthier. I'm gonna lose some weight. You know, and I'm, that's gonna be my focus. I'm gonna work out more and I'm going to eat less. Okay, this is your goal. Um, if you do that, it's great. But until you can sit there and go, you know what, I am going to be serious about this. So I'm going to lose 10 pounds in the next 10 weeks. Well, if you do that, you go, well, that's about one pound a week, which seems a lot more manageable, right? And then if you say, well, so in order for me, so, you know, I can lose one pound a week, that's 10 weeks, 10 pounds, that's pretty significant, if you can keep that up. Uh, because you can do the next 10 weeks, right? That'd be 20 weeks. But let's say just to lose the 10, uh, 10 pounds in 10 weeks. So it's down to one pound a week. And I, if I cut out 300 calories, which could be like a soda or you know whatever, and I can walk my dog for 45 minutes a day, I'm there already. These are really simple things. So in your business journey, I did this with my, you know, if I were to do $35,000 
uh, a year, I needed $3,000 a month. And what do I need to do to get the 3000 bucks a month? And so I figured I sent out those little, po those little Polaroid things. I sent out 50 of them a day, every day. I did the research and I figured if I get a certain, you know, they, I heard that uh, return rate was like 2% or something. So I actually did the numbers and I thought, well, because I'm new, I might get like a half a percent to 1%. Well, that whole Polaroid thing actually gave me a pretty close to 10% return rate, believe it or not. And so I, you know, did a, it, it was pretty good for me, but breaking it down so that it's manageable, so that it's something you can do every day. So postage at that time was like nine cents and the envelope might be, I don't know, 10 cents or something. So it was a very inexpensive way to get things done. Uh, eventually I thought Polaroids were kind of expensive. Uh, so I did the, um, I got a camera and I went next door and the guy in the camera shop, I did it in batches. So it was like uh, 12 cents a copy. So again, you know, you keep, if you break it, if you want action and you break it down to small actions, these were not big actions, but I did a million dollars the first, you know, 12 month period because my return rates on that, like I sold to Neiman Marcus, American Airlines. I mean, I mean, those are pretty big companies. So think about that. I think that's great advice, Victoria. And I appreciate you sharing that. I do have two more questions before we go. And I know I've kept you and I'm grateful for you <laughs> staying on. And I think this is one of those times when you're supposed to like follow the host and sort of get to the end, but I'm not done yet. Um, one question you could answer relatively quickly. Does it blow your mind that all you have 15 million people buy from you over of the over the course of 30 maybe. year career yeah does it blow your mind that you go on tv and these people are actually watching the tv and buying like doesn't that seem crazy yeah yeah it is it is crazy and um i've had to like go look at my records and everything it is really crazy like i said to you earlier i feel so blessed and because the journey that I've taken is so different that, you know, most people like who grows up thinking, oh, I'm going to go on TV and sell jewelry. Like, you know, you can't actually write a script like that. It's so stupid. You know, you, you can't do that. So working hard. Um, and I don't, you know, like I said, all these things just kind of came just by working hard every single day, putting in the dues and respecting uh, and, and just understanding the world around you, you know, I do have the financial means now to, you know, treat all the people that I love in my family to, to, to the life they, they deserve. But I also remember where that, all that is coming from. So really, um, I, I'm very grateful. And I, I, it does seem unreal. It does seem unreal even now, like somebody has to remind me. I mean, people have reminded me you're, you know, it's just an amazing, astonishing, whatever. And um, it is. I just don't know any other way to describe it. But I also want to tell you, Brandon, I hope if you are listening to uh, Brandon and myself now, that nothing I said today was trying to show off what I've done or to uh, be braggadocious about all the things I've accomplished. It's really about the things that I've accomplished are being done by an ordinary person who came here with nothing, who had nothing to look forward to, who held on to that dream, refused to let the dream go. And to think that everything was possible if you just you know, put your mind to it. And while I sit here and tell you that you know, the numbers I've done, which is pretty unbelievable, maybe a lot of people won't do the 500 million, but you could do 5 million, you could do 500,000, you could do whatever. That's a great start. I mean, I'd be happy with that. Well, me too. And Victoria, thank you so thank much you. for being on. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for you know letting me share my story. And I hope it's changed somebody. I want to come back and um, hear from somebody who said, you know what? When I listened to that Victoria chick, I mean, she really made me like get off my butt and do something and look look where I'm at. And I, I want to I want I want to have one of those moments from your show. I know I know that'll happen after people listen to you. So thank you so.